Challenging the global economic order, leaders of the so-called BRICS group of emerging nations meet in South Africa. But is the vision that united Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa starting to crumble? And who is gaining the most from this relationship? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Jane Dutton. It was a vision born out of the global financial crisis. Brazil, India, China and Russia seeking to distance themselves from the economic woes of the West and to become less dependent on the volatility of the US dollar and the euro, then known just as BRIC. South Africa was invited to join the fold two years ago in part as a gateway to the wider continent. Together, BRICS nations now make up more than 40% of the world's population, almost 3 billion people. The bloc generates a fifth of the world's gross domestic product, and the World Bank says it's driving half of the global economic growth. This is the fifth time the group has met and the first time the summit has been held in South Africa. A raft of business and trade deals have been agreed between the BRICS members. China and Brazil have also signed a pact to do billions of dollars of trade in their local currencies rather than the US dollar or the euro. And a deal has been hammered out to establish a BRICS development bank. This is to rival Western-backed institutions such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund. There had been talk of a starting balance of $50 billion to co-fund infrastructure in developing regions, but this may be scaled back. It could be several years before the bank is up and running. This summit is taking place as BRICS nations see their economic fortunes faltering. It's raising questions about whether the original vision is still relevant. Has it become the China and India show? And can South Africa stand shoulder to shoulder with its new friends? Or does it, and Africa in general, risk being exploited? South Africa has pitched itself as the gateway to the continent and because of that it's invited 14 heads of state and other African leaders here to the BRICS summit where all of those people will get the opportunity uh, to talk to the BRICS president and Indian Prime Minister. There has been a rising rhetoric however on the continent uh, over fear of a new form of colonialism. Now South Africa has its own legislation which it enforces which is really quite strict but that is not the situation for many other African countries. South Africa's really been pushing very hard for its relationship with the other BRICS members to be made more equal. It wants there to be a lot of investment and joint projects towards really adding benefit to this country's mineral resources and commodities. Remember, South Africa has 80% of the world's known platinum reserves. It wants to be able to add value to that uh, commodity, to that resource, rather than shipping it overseas as a raw product. The African experts I've been talking to here at say the onus really is on the individual African countries to make sure they're not exploited. That means things like introducing the right legislation, enforcing that legislation and getting rid of corruption. They say it's naive to think that without those things in place that there won't be some temptation or level of exploitation. Let's bring in our guests now. In Johannesburg, Duncan Clark, CEO of Global Pacific and Partners. Duncan has written the book, Africa's Future, Darkness to Destiny. From Nairobi, Ali Khan Satchu, a former investment banker specializing in emerging market financing, now CEO at Rich Management in Kenya. And from our London Broadcast Centre, Michael Cox, professor of international relations at the London School of Economics and author of the book, Power Shifts, Economic Change, and the decline of the West. Welcome to you all. Duncan, let me start off with you. South Africa is in an economic mess, high unemployment rate, economic disparities, labor disputes, to name just a few problems. So why do you think it is hosting this conference and why does it get to sit at the BRICS table? Well, I think it has lobbied heavily to get entry to this BRICS nomenclature and uh, it has a woeful track record on economic growth that hasn't altered, but there doesn't look to be much change going forward at this present time. So it's externalizing a little bit to hope that uh, it'll get a lift through trade and possible investment through 
the association with the BRIC uh, countries that it's now uh, joined into. Michael, Jim O'Neill, the man who coined the BRIC acronym, was surprised at South Africa joining BRIC. Are you? Uh, well, at one level, I am surprised like uh, Jim O'Neill. Actually, the origin of the term BRICS did not begin with the economic crisis, as I'm sure you know. It actually began with Goldman Sachs back in 2001, and Jim O'Neill was both trying to differentiate four big economies from the other emerging economies, and also making a prediction, which turned out not to be too bad, about the future growth of those four economies, particularly China. Later on, Jim O'Neill came back and said, I'm surprised. I was too conservative back then. Actually, my prediction turned out to be truer uh, than I had originally anticipated. But he, too, was very surprised because South Africa's position in the world economy is much less significant than that, that to the other four. OK, Ali Khan, what is it then? Is, is South Africa being mm. used as a gateway to the rest of Africa? I, I think South Africa's inclusion uh, in the BRIC nomenclature is all around a geopolitical calculation. It speaks to the importance of Africa vis-a-vis um, -vis, vis -vis BRIC. I mean, just to give you some trade numbers, uh, 10 years ago, trade between the BRIC and Africa was about $20 billion. Uh, today, it's $250 billion. And I think it was a geopolitical calculation more than anything else to include South Africa in that, uh, uh, in that name. Uh, South Africa is about 2.5% only of, of the total uh, uh, economy of BRICS. I think S South Africa reminds me of Joe Frazier in the rumble in the jungle. It's coming in with a lot of noise, but ultimately I think uh, it, 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 it's, it's not as powerful as it once was, and we're going to have a lot, a lot of change on the uh, sub-Saharan African continent. And in a way, they're relying, resting on their laurels. They're no longer the gateway uh, to Africa. I think you've got an engine of growth in East Africa, in West Africa. And Nigeria, after all, will overtake South Africa very, very soon indeed. So I think it's a, it's a convenient geopolitical calculation. Um, uh, but it's going to find that over a p very short period of time, it's going to get overtaken by events, in my view. Duncan, you seem to agree with that. And at the same time, do you think South Africa has been a little naive here that they are putting themselves in a position of being exploited, possibly? Well, I'm not so sure necessarily South Africa would be exploited. But um, for China, it's a, it's a launch pad into parts of Africa. On the other hand, it's quite correct that uh, people in the resource industries, oil, gas and mining, go direct to source, not through South Africa. Um, the problem here is that this is a fashion a kind of orchestra in play. Uh, we've heard it before. If you go back three, four decades, there were the least developed countries, then the least less developed countries. We've had the new industrialized economies, the NICs, and we moved on to, well, the BRICS, and then, of course, its manifestation, including South Africa. And now you have other uh, nomenclature being offered to the markets in the form of the civets and the mist and the rest of them. So I think it will play its course out and in time uh, erode. Uh, South Africa will not sustain its relative position, weak as it is. Uh, it's a very small portion of uh, the BRICS GDP. It's a very small portion, too, and a falling piece of the African economic architecture, whether sub-Saharan Africa, whether SADC even, and indeed uh, on the world stage. So it has a declining role into the future, uh, come what may. OK, let's let up on South Africa for a bit, because South Africa is hosting this summit, and here in a nutshell is what the president is expecting from it. We are convinced that through purposeful engagement, we can negotiate new types of mutually beneficial developmental agreements with BRICS countries. Michael, what do you think he's talking about there, the, the benefits? Well, I go back to the expertise of your two previous speaker. I mean, it does seem to me that South Africa is bargaining from an increasingly weak position. So as your position objectively weakens, your, your rhetoric tends to get stronger. You always find this at international, international meetings. I think there's also a dimension here which has not yet been talked about. There's China. I mean, China by far and away is the most important of the BRICS. Take China away, and the BRICS are really deeply insignificant, it seems to me. With China in, it's seriously significant. And China, I think, diplomatically was one of the big movers to get South Africa in. Um, 
But nonetheless, if you look at the economics of the BRICS, they are big, and there's no doubt of their growing significance. Jim O'Neill got something very right in terms of the growth. Nonetheless, while we talk a lot about the BRICS as an emerging part of the world economy, let's not forget that the United States economy alone constitutes about one-fifth of world GDP, which is about the total of the five BRICS put together. The other issue, which is equally important, is there are other emerging economies, Turkey, Mexico, Indonesia. Uh, are these going to be included in the BRICS? And then what do you do with that famous acronym, called the BRICS. Yeah, there might be a better fit. Okay, well, it is interesting using figures as a, a measure of success or otherwise. And, Michael, I will come back to talk more about China. But when it comes to the BRICS partners, so trade between BRICS nations surged to $282 billion last year. That's up from just $27 billion in 2002. And it's estimated that figure could soar to as much as $500 billion by 2015. But these countries hardly ever invest in one another. Just 2.5% of foreign investment made by BRICS countries is made within the group. And guess what? 40% of foreign investment goes to the developed world's largest economies, the United States, the European Union and Japan. So given that, let's hear, hear what the leaders have had to say at the summit about that. It's the biggest market in BRICS holds a unique place in the global economy. Our countries have 40% of the global population. BRICS nations have large natural resources and have well-prepared industrial bases and well-trained personnel. We create about 30% of the global gross profit. For the very first time back in 2012, developing countries attracted more foreign direct investment than developed countries. BRICS countries alone were the destination of no less than $263 billion in investment flows, the equivalent of 20% of the overall FDI worldwide. So Ali Khan there, they're saying what it is that they can bring to each other and how great they are. But And you touched on this figure a little earlier on. They only invest 2.5% with each other. I mean, that's hardly any investment at all. They prefer their neighbours. It, 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 it's, a, it's a shocking number. I mean, it really takes me back. And I think, you know, if you look on the returns that they're receiving for investing in the developed economies, whom they are, by the way, bailing out in many cases, I'm the banker to the United States is China in many ways, and the returns they're receiving are negligible, you would say to them that it makes no economic sense to be making such a small investment in the developing world, and in particular in Africa. You know, if I was sitting and managing the uh, uh, $3 trillion worth of reserves that the Chinese hold, I would be throwing it at speed into the African continent because the returns on my money would be substantially higher than any returns I can think of that I'm getting in the bond markets in particular where they're overly invested. So I absolutely agree, to, agree with what you're saying. And I think furthermore, that's what's sort of the raison d'etre that's driving uh, the thinking behind creating a BRICS bank because not only do they want uh, a bigger position, a bigger say in some of these institutions like the World Bank and the IMF, and so far President Obama has managed to fend that request off, which means to me that they've really got to look at creating their own vehicles. And I think, you know, they've got to get but, a whole lot more aggressive about it. I mean, they can't really compete with those financial it. institutions, can they, with the rather limited amount of money that they're all required to put in, around $2 billion? I was surprised that, that it got downsized so sharply. I thought, you know, the 50 billion number was, was optically looks big, but it makes sense given how much money you're talking about a combination of $4.4 trillion worth of reserves. So I, I was a bit disappointed with that. I was surprised that they couldn't bang their heads together and get it organized, and they seemed to be slowing the momentum down. But I think it makes perfect sense for them to go for that 50 billion number and get on with it because, you know, there's no time like the present. This is a sort of land grab moment, a 21st con uh, century convergence that's happening in Africa. You can see, you know, across the African continent, uh, we're going to get a big crowding in of capital. And I, I think I would be surprised to see that given that they understood where Africa was coming from more intuitively than the Western world because it's, you know, it, it has 
happened to them just two decades ago or a decade ago, so they, they have a closer understanding of what's happening, I would have thought they'd really look to upsize that bet, uh, which is currently, uh, you know, although it sounds big, is not really that big at all. They've got the money to throw around. I mean, you know, the Chinese president was talking about putting 10 billion into a port in Tanzania. If, if they've got the money, China, India, Brazil, and I think they're going to start to change direction quite sharply. Duncan, Duncan can you see it happening, this bank? Well, and let's be realistic about Africa. It's a less than $2 trillion economy uh, split between 55 states which have got all the seeds of uh, further fragmentation over the next 20, 30 years. And we've seen already several states uh, in formation and other semi-autonomous regions in Africa. So if you're in the world of real politic for investment and Chinese, you, I don't think we'll throw your money. You will do what you're doing. You will bargain on a government-to-government -government basis for, for resource access and deal flow. And if you have to put in ports and so on, it's related to excavation of minerals, oil, gas, and other resource interests that you might primarily hold, notwithstanding other parts of the information uh, technologies and infrastructure you might invest in. So Africa is no, um, no, no simple place. And I also don't buy the idea that, you know, that because China, Brazil, Russia indeed, or maybe India, are somehow part of a developing world, uh, that they somehow know Africa better. In fact, uh, this is probably untrue. Uh, I travel to all these places and I don't find the knowledge base there better than would be the case in, in Europe or indeed in America where there's been much longer, deeper and more extensive association with business and corporate deal flow in the continent. So I think it's um, early days. The fact that they've cut back on the investment capital commitment might reflect the fact they're going at the rate of the slowest common denominator, the briquette, uh, that can only bricolage on the economic stage and that is South Africa, which lacks the funds for this kind of uh, large-scale investment outside its own borders. Michael, do you think that is why we are seeing a bit of a kickback against Chinese investment in Africa? If we could pick up on the point that Duncan made there, that, that possibly these countries don't understand what makes Africa tick. Well, I mean, who understands Africa or African countries better? I mean, that's, uh, it's, I, I have no idea what the answer to that is question is perhaps Africans understand themselves better than outsiders. My overall view of China, for which I have some sympathy economically, although I have some problems with it politically, is that I'm not sure China really understands Africa any better than anybody else. I mean, they're in Africa, not because they understand it, but for resources. And they've aggressively gone for that. And well, let they continue to do so. And they put in a lot of unconditional aid into Africa, uh, rather than the West, which puts in Condition. So everything China does is self-interest and economically, dare I even say, mercantilist driven. And each of these four countries is doing everything they're doing, either meeting together in South Africa or investing around the world in pretty small numbers in each other for purely national interest reasons. And I, I would come back to what the last, the last uh, speaker said, with whom I think I more agree than the other one, which is to say one should not over, over, overstate uh, what is really going on here. I mean, the, uh, China puts money into the American economy to prop up the American economy. Why does it do so? Because it knows that a recession in the United States has massive consequences for domestic economic and social stability in China. The United States will be far, by far and away China's main economic partner and its, own, and, and its own region than anything going on in Africa or indeed in the other BRIC countries. You know, these are hard-headed rulers, uh, both in China, whether in India or Brazil uh, or in Russia, who look at the world in a very, very realist way. I think they get a bit of status out of this meeting. There's a bit of grandstanding. There is some significance in the, in the bank. I'm not running it down completely. But let's, let, let's be realistic about what they're really looking for at this meeting and indeed in Africa. Now, whether the BRICS buddies have come of age or not is clearly the subject of some debate. But there does seem to be a broader consensus on future potential, certainly from China. <laughs> The global economic growth rate is slow, and BRICS economic growth is slowing. But that doesn't mean that BRICS countries' economies are slipping down the slope. On the contrary, the potential of BRICS development is infinite. Industrialization, urbanization, spread of IT applications, and even more agricultural modernization will generate huge energy and will create big market opportunities.
Ali Khan, do you think China should be concerned about what's happening in Africa? The governor of Nigeria's central bank has called for Africans to recognize that their romance with China has helped to bring about a new form of imperialism. If I could just quickly answer one question and say that, you know, everybody's looking at Africa from the point of view of their national interest, China, the U.S., et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, no one is, no one is saying that one entity is coming in uh, a la Bob Geldorf and wants to, wants to save the world or anything. Everyone's looking at this from, from a business point of view. I think with respect to China, with respect to the other point about, Kenya, uh, about Africa, it's asymmetric. There are f more than 50 letterboxes, whereas there's only one letterbox in China and one in Brazil. So I think that's a, that's a very valid issue. The Chinese, you know, the recent engagement has been very much a last decade phenomenon, um, and, and it's all happened rather quickly. So obviously there are going to be bumps uh, in this engagement, and I think, you know, the Chinese are very well aware of that. After all, they've opened up a very big TV station here in Nairobi, or they've spent almost as much as you spent in Doha, and I think that's all around controlling the message about this story. I read uh, the, uh, the governor's comments, and I think he's quite right. I think, you know, the Chinese have to look at this in a more sophisticated and nuanced manner. It's not just about what you can dig out of the ground and ship over to Asia. It's also about the, the, the people who walk upon the ground. And there are going to be 2 billion of them by 2050. That's a huge consumer market that people want to be in touch with and are excited about. So I think, you know, China, uh, it's no panacea. But I've got to say, the one thing China did is that they brought equilibrium into the demand side of the equation for Africa's commodities. And that's what really helped our GDP rates speed up. And I've got to be grateful for that. I think I, it's, it would be churlish not to be so. So, but so there's certainly plenty an important of, uh, player. Of and Duncan, there are clearly trust issues here. Is the lack of trust among some of the members a problem? Well, um, it's difficult to know if you look over periods of time, they've been allies and I wouldn't say enemies, but uh, in discordant camps at one point or another. India, but China, for I example. I believe this uh, really for the future lies. Well, it, it, the future is, and the current conditions really uh, relate back to strategic uh, interests. And on the one side, you've got commodity exporters, the other commodity importers. Some are capital surplus countries, some are capital deficit, some are high, some are low growth and all sorts of other trade and other matrix problems of uh, interest on a strategic and national level. So to me, the, that would explain the uh, limited relationships uh, and to, to the extent on investment in each other, the question of trust possibly. And also, I, I would say that fact that um, there's been sort of a, a, a narrative put forward here about setting up against Western Bretton's Woods institutions. And I think if you look at the scale and the numbers and the realities of this, uh, this is a fatuous claim. Because um, if you took the amount of investment that is being put forward, and even this uh, BRICS development bank, which hasn't really got off the runway yet, and goodness knows it may take several years before the, the bird flies, uh, these numbers are not anywhere near what you're getting out of the support coming from World Bank, IMF, okay. even uh, Duncan, European I'm going to have to stop agencies. you there. Okay, let's take a quick look at Facebook reaction. Uma Ibrahim says BRICS efforts need to be complemented positively. These BRICS countries are the current global economics giants. They are all over international markets, more especially the South American and African market, solemnly for economic reason, neither for political nor for supremacy. Uh, well, Gonga says BRICS has come to stay. I hope these dummy African dictators will wake up from their slumber and utilize the opportunities provided by the BRICS under its proposed bank. Tom Ma says China wants to dominate and has chosen areas over which it can dominate through use of business, loans and other means to create dependency. It is trying to make African countries dependent through use of money, infrastructural projects, oil and mineral extraction and purchases. These are not new techniques in efforts to control. And finally, Mahfouz Rahman says it is the right time to stop Western supremacy over the world. My country, India, should take the lead to strengthen the BRICS along with right-minded countries to stop the West. And that's where we end this inside story. Thank you very much to my guests, Duncan Clark, Ali Khan Sachu and Michael Cox. Thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to watch the show again, visit our website, aljazeera.com, where you can also leave us your comments. Thanks very much for watching. Goodbye for now.